This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Hello, everyone. This is Felina for SE Radio. My guest today with me is Andrea Stefik. Andrea Stefik is an associate professor in computer science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Andreas has been working on creating technologies that make it easier for people, including those with disabilities, to write computer software. He helped establish the first national educational infrastructure for blind or visually impaired students to learn computer science. And he is also the inventor of Quorum, the first evidence-oriented programming language. In 2016, Andreas received the White House Champions of Change Award in computer science education. Welcome to the show, Andreas. Thanks, and thanks for inviting me. So this show is about how blind and visually impaired people interact with software. But first, let's start with the basics. How many blind or visually impaired people are there in the world? What should we take into account when designing software for them? It's about 1.3 million people ballpark. and uh, In the US, that is. In the US. And that's a lot of people. It's enough to at least make a dent on any kind of market you could sell for. So help us understand how blind people use a computer, because most people that listen to the show probably are sighted. Sighted is how we call people that, that can see, and they are used to using the mouse, looking at the screen. What do blind and visually, visually impaired people do? There's a variety of things that they do. Um, many people that are blind or visually impaired have partial vision, or sometimes called functional vision, depending on what it is. And usually that means they can see some things, or they can see color, or they can see some amount of light, depending upon the person. So in those cases, you might use technologies like screen magnifiers, or you might use literally a magnifying glass or other types of things. Um, if you are non-sighted, meaning you have no sight at all, or you have no, no vision that's effectively functional, then a more typical device is either brain or a screen reader. Probably the most common is screen reader technologies, and basically what it means is that the computer translates what's on the screen into speech. Can you give us an impression for how that would look like? So if, if a screen reader listens to or looks at a web page, how does that sound slash look? Here, I'll turn it on. <laughs> APH. Agencies receiving federal quota funds. Fiscal year 2016 web content. You are currently on web content. To enter the web area, press control, option, shift, down arrow. That particular screen reader is called VoiceOver. It's the screen reading option that happens to be on Mac. On Windows, there's a bunch of them. There's one called NVDA, which is free. There's one that's made by a company called Freedom Scientific called JAWS. It's pretty popular, but quite, quite expensive. And Windows has one built in as well that's been improving over the last few years. So when we listen to it, it's not only reading the text on the website. It can also navigate the website and give us information on where you are. It said something like you are now at. Yeah, that's good. So there's a funny thing. So academics often talk about this with a certain term. They call it the where am I problem. Um, I think the person that defined that was a, a woman by the name of, <clears throat> excuse me, Joan Fran Francione or Francione. I'm not sure. I've never met her actually. But in any case, the idea is pretty simple. It's that the screen reader tries to give you both a sense of the content and a, a sense of like where you are on the page, like the semantics of a web page, like I'm in a heading or I'm in a paragraph or I'm on a level two heading, stuff like that. Yeah, because not only consuming the text is a problem, navigating is also a big problem, I've understood, right? It's yeah, that's... really impaired. Yes. The navigation parts of it are probably the most crucial because think about it like this. If I gave you a long website and I just read the text linearly, it would be pretty hard to understand because it might be very long. And if you can navigate a web page, then you can selectively determine what information to, to understand when, and that makes it a lot easier. So, so far we've talked about websites and navigation, but of course there's also apps and programs. Do they also work with a built-in screen reader or do app and program developers have to do something special? It's complicated, unfortunately. So on the, webs, on the web, there's a number of rather excellent standards for accessibility, in part just because the web's used a lot. Uh, so to give your listeners um, an example, one is called ARIA. ARIA is basically a way that you can do interactive websites. It's sort of the type of thing if you wanted like an interactive Facebook or something to be uh, blind accessible. 
Apps can definitely be accessible as well, but how they're accessible varies by platform and is actually one of the sort of pain points. Uh, for example, if I want to make my app from Apple accessible, there's certain Apple-y type things that I have to do, and they're kind of tricky. And Android has its own platform with its own languages and ecosystem. On top of that, if you're using apps on something like a tablet or phone, they have different screen reader technologies. So Apple has VoiceOver, which I think most people credit a scholar named Sean Kane for inventing. Sort of like really cool um, gestures that you use specifically for blind individuals. Um, and Android sort of has those too, but they kind of have weird variations and are complicated. Can we talk a little bit more about voiceover on the iPhone? Because I've, I've seen it in action, but I think our audience might be a little bit confused. How does that work with, because the only interface is the screen and the icons. How does that work and how does it work with the special gestures? Okay, so how to describe it in words. <laughs> so um, think about it like this. Like if I want to, if I'm a sighted user and I'm scrolling along, along, I might move my finger up and down and that would let me see the content. But if I'm blind, oftentimes what I do is I might tap or tap on parts of the screen or double tap to interact with it. And when I do that, if I hit a target, it'll talk. So the idea is that I can use gestures to sort of interact semantically with the tablet as opposed to just scrolling with a finger and reading it. So it would read, for example, the name of the apps, and then if I hear the app I want, I would tap, and then it would open that app. Yeah, stuff like that. So like my friend, a friend of mine that does Uber all the time on uh, his iPhone, taps it in a certain way, and that'll give him a sense of where it is on the map and things like that. So you can actually use a lot of apps so long as the developer codes it in. Yeah, so let's talk about that as long as the developer codes it in a little bit. So how well are we doing yeah, at this point, are most apps, operating systems, and websites accessible? Are they not? Are they medium accessible? How, how well are we doing? I don't think I could give you a number in terms of a percentage. But a feeling for me. Yeah, I would say that there are some companies that do a really great job and that those are often somewhat bigger ones, but that we have a really long way to go. And that's not a criticism, it's just an observation. I mean, oftentimes uh, developers don't actually get any training on building these in school and it's not trivial. So it's not like it's not like we have a long way to go because the technologies are all bad for some reason. It's just that we usually don't even teach this in school. You know, a developer doesn't learn about the NS accessible libraries on Mac, which are the common thing. Or if you're on desktop platforms, uh, Microsoft has its own libraries and Apple has its own libraries and Linux has its own libraries. And all of them are different and none of them are compatible. So personally, I think that it would be a lot easier for developers to develop accessible technology if there was like a unifying standard across platforms, but that doesn't really exist. At, at this stage of the game, at least. Yeah, that was actually one of my goals in inviting you for an episode is to make developers more aware and to help them what they can do to make their software more accessible, which was also my next question. So <laughs> what can we do as developers? What are the things we need to think about when wanting to make our apps more accessible? Okay, so the, the first thing to do if you design a website is that there's a special set of guidelines from the W3C and they are specifically for accessibility. Okay, so we'll make sure we'll link to those in the show notes so people can check them out. Yeah, and th those are effect easily the most comprehensive source about how to make a website accessible. And they're great. They just tell you, like, if you have a link, how you make that accessible. What kind of, if you have a picture and obviously you can't see it, you put in some kind of alt text, right? And there's, there's all sorts of small things that you can do. There's also some online accessibility checkers that you can use. Oh, nice. And they're not perfect. You know, they, they can't tell you that your website is easy to use, but sometimes they can at least give you like a check and balance for some of the easy thing. Like, hey, you forgot your alt text for that image. You should go fix that, stuff like that. Yeah, what, what are some of the issues? So alt text is, I think, something people are familiar with, even if they don't always use it. You mentioned links. What are best practices for links that are easy to fix? Okay, so with links, one thing that is generally good is to not give your link a moniker that doesn't have semantic meaning. So for example, um, 
to do this, go here. The word here should not be a link because then when you get it through the, the, um, the screen reader, it's gonna stop and it's gonna say link here. And you're gonna say, where's here? So what would be better is to say, go to the website for the blah and have that whole part be a link. It sounds like a minor thing, but in a screen reader it can make a difference because you have to listen to it. Yeah, that, that is relatively easy to fix because- Super. So let me understand how exactly that works with a screen reader. If you're navigating, there would be an option to go through all the links. And if they were all labeled here, it would be here, 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 here. Whereas if you would say the website of Andreas or the website of University of Nevada, as a link, you could more easily navigate. Right? Yeah, that's the kind of idea. Like any time that you have a structure, give it a semantic meaning. That's exactly right. Yeah. Any other things that are relatively easy to fix that we should think of? Uh, yeah, so another one that is kind of an obvious one, I'll tell you one that's sort of adorable. My daughter is like five, and her school does a great job, but they have a couple of accessibility flaws on their website that are at, just make, made me laugh a little bit. Like, they didn't do it intentionally. It's okay. And so one thing that they did that, that just I thought was funny is they, they wanted to put a schedule online. So what they did is they took a picture of the schedule, like a complicated spreadsheet, and then they put that onto the website, and then it shrunk. So if you're visually impaired, you can't actually read it because the text is too blotted out. And if you have a screen reader, you're going to get to that thing, and it's going to say image. So you can't actually do anything. So one thing to do is don't like replace content with already accessible things. You know, if you need to have a table, put a table in there, and then give it the, the, the markup that it needs from the W3C. Yeah, so images should be for making your website nicer, but they shouldn't be replacing content exactly. that could also have been represented textually. That's correct. That is actionable advice. So what about a user interface? If we're not, no longer talking about a website, but something that has buttons and drop-down menus, scroll bars, what do we do with those? So that's a little bit trickier because it depends on the platform and it also depends on the API that you're using. So for example, um, if you're using Java, unfortunately, while Java technically has an accessibility architecture, a lot of it doesn't really work that well or in some cases really at all. So this is unfortunate not because you know, it just is, but because if you're a developer, you might be thinking, all right, I'm gonna to code to the accessibility interface, it's gonna be awesome, I'm gonna make this totally accessible, and then you turn it on on a particular platform and you're like, oh, it doesn't work. And you can verify that by turning on a screen reader, which are free oftentimes, and so you just flip it on and say, oh, it doesn't make sound. I'll, I'll give you an example. In the NetBeans uh, development environment, it's like a tool for programmers, the text editor didn't work for years. So it's like the fundamental thing like about how to use a, a development environment, like writing text, it was not accessible. What was wrong with it? Java's accessibility system doesn't work. Wow. And it's, you know, it is what it is. And there are other, there are other types of environments that are much more accessible. So for example, Microsoft, for whatever reason, gets flack a lot, but for accessibility, they've done a pretty dang good job, right? They, their APIs work pretty well. They're not perfect, but they're well thought through over many years and they're compatible with a lot of systems. It's not a plug for Microsoft. I have no uh, vested interest, but um, they have this thing called iAccessible2. And basically if you code to iAccessible2, then your stuff is almost certain to be accessible. But if you're working at sort of a higher level than sort of the low level old comm type stuff, and you're just using C Sharp, they've done a pretty dang good job of like building it in so that buttons and text boxes and stuff like that are mostly accessible. Nice. So if you stick with developer tools from big platforms, usually they are okay. Well, it depends on the platform. Java's pretty big too, but it's debatable whether it's accessible depending on platform, whereas C Sharp is at least pretty dang accessible on Windows. In terms of on Mac, they do have something called NS Accessible, and that does work pretty well if you're only writing in the Mac ecosystem. The tricky thing is whenever you're using other programming languages in those ecosystems. Like for example, is Smalltalk accessible? Is Python accessible? It's, it's kind of you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Because of the platform. In yeah, the see of those tools, but Python on Windows is different from Python on Mac. Right? It can be. It can yeah, be. It depends on like what the devs implemented. So. So, so there's still some to 
some things that we need to know about as developers because the platforms aren't going to take care of them. Yeah, it, in fact, this is one reason why I've cared about the consistency of programming languages in part is because it impacts some groups pretty poorly, like the blind. You know, like, uh, I'll give you an example. Our tools for the blind, I think, are written in like eight programming languages, and we don't want them to be, but we have to connect to these different systems. There's really no choice. Something like that, six to eight, I forget. Yeah, a lot. A lot, it, yeah. It isn't out of the box. Mm-hmm. So what about other things that we should take care of? So one of the things that has surprised me a lot in working with like children only a little bit is that some stuff like working with the mouse takes lots of energy if you're visually impaired, but not entirely blind. So you can see a little bit. So we, we sighted people would think, oh, you can use the mouse, but tracing where the mouse cursor is and using the mouse takes lots of energy. That was this thing that surprised me a lot. Are there a few other things that we sh- like this that we should think about? Uh, yeah, and actually there's some stuff that GUI, t- GUI toolkit designers can do that are pretty easy. So for example, if you're designing some kind of a text box type interface, and it doesn't have to be a text box, but something that where you would follow a pointer, whenever the pointer moves, if someone is magnified, follow it. Right, So that the, if you're moving a magnification system, they always have the context of where the most important thing is. Oh, so the, full, the focus should follow the cursor. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. So like if you're like, uh, for example, one of my old students, uh, I shouldn't say his name since, you know, <laughs> because he happens to be blind. Right. And um, he uh, used a magnifier pretty heavily. And when he would use just typical GUI elements, for example, imagine if you pressed a button and it opened a menu, but it didn't jump to that menu and you're highly magnified. It's a lot easier if, if the magnification system follows you, but not all the operating systems do that. Oh, and then you'd have to scroll, which is super hard if yeah. you're using a magnifier. Yeah, so I like, click the menu and then you have to like tap the mouse a bunch to sort of get it up there and hope that you can find it and it gets tricky. So focus is a big issue. Focus is a huge issue. A huge issue. Yeah. Any other huge issues like that? Uh, let's see. So for in terms of trying to make general user interfaces accessible, one that uh, my team has been working on that I think is really fun is we've been trying to figure out how to make graphics accessible. So here, here's the tricky part. If you've got something like, like let's just say Unity 3D, which is sort of like this game design platform, right? We have a, a grant from the National Science Foundation right now to try to take big, complicated 3D interfaces like that and make them blind accessible. But here's the rub. While you can make buttons and stuff like that accessible, there's just no way you can tell OpenGL, make yourself blind accessible. There just is no toolkit It is inherently visual. It is inherently visual, except any kind of 3D application still has things you could potentially tell a screen reader about. So for example, if I'm navigating terrain or something like that, or trying to adjust terrain or a 3D model, hypothetically, you could provide a list of things that could be positions on that terrain and tell it to go up and down, which would still give a screen reader information. So one of the things we're trying to invent in the lab is a way for blind children to be able to write their own 3D computer games and be able to adjust it through their typical screen reading device without needing any special stuff while still having it be hardware accelerated and all that stuff. Nice. It's been a hard project that's taken me four years to get a handle around in my brain, but I think we're getting pretty close. And are those things then also usable for, let's say, more practical things that are inherently visual? I'm thinking of a diagram or a map or a graph. See, that's the thing. If you can do that for the hard stuff in graphics, any of the rest comes comes easily. Yeah, fair enough. Oh yeah, we talked about frameworks and libraries already a little bit. So you mentioned NS Accessible. That's a framework that we can use to make stuff more accessible, sort of out of the box. Are there other things we should check out? Frameworks, libraries? Yeah, the big ones, the big, the two biggest ones are NS Accessible on Mac and iAccessible 2 on Windows. But I think since, um, in terms of the web, by far the two things that people should know about are the W3C accessibility standards and also this thing called ARIA. It's mildly, mildly hard to Google. Sometimes you might have to say A-R-I-A space accessibility. Um, but the idea is that the W3C standards sort of tell you any, pretty much anything you would need to know about basic like content. And the ARIA standards are really good at trying to help you understand like interactive content. Cool. Or we'll auto-update make... Ajax stuff, things like that. We'll make sure we add all of that to the show notes so people that want to know more can check it out easily. Cool. So, so far we've mainly talked about tools, everyday tools that many people use, like a website or an app or a phone. 
But there's also people that program while blind. And we as developers might make tools for people that want to program also more accessible. So I want to talk about that a little bit. How do blind people program and what should we know about blind developers to make developer tools more accessible? Yeah, so actually blind developers um, fall into the same categories, so either visually impaired or totally blind, and they do amazingly interesting things. So for example, a number of blind developers that design technologies for all sorts of things. One of, one of my good friends, his name is uh, Sina Baram. He designs accessibility installations for museums. He, he won this award from the White House a bunch of years back and got connected with museums all over the world to build like weird accessible interfaces and stuff like that. If you go to a museum and there's an accessible thing, it's very likely he's been involved in some capacity or another. So what are we thinking about accessible museums then? Someone that's describing the painting. Uh, it could be all sorts of stuff. And to be honest, I'm not exactly sure all the details of what he does. <laughs> but I've seen like some stuff here and there. It seems pretty cool. But the point is, as the point isn't so much the details of what he does. It's how he does it. So how does he do it? So what he does is he uses his screen reader and then he listens to the text. Now, there's some obvious complexity there. So for example, if you to a sighted user, sometimes as developers, we don't really think about the sort of weird, wacky syntax that happens. But as a blind developer, you literally have to listen to four left paren, int i equals zero, semicolon i less than 10, semicolon i less, uh, i plus plus right paren, left brace, or stuff like that. So a screen reader that's normally used for text is then used in source code, and it just reads all the symbols. Yeah, and it's not like you can't get used to it, but the problem is it depends, you know, a lot on like where you are in the development pipeline. Like if you're a exper super experienced professional, you've already made it past all the barriers and you're good to go, then yeah, you're going to be fine. But we've also spent a lot of time talking to blind children. And let's just say the first time that a blind child hears four left paren int equals zero semicolon i less than 10 semicolon i plus plus right paren left brace, it's a little weird and it sort of makes you wonder why languages are built that way. <laughs> Fair enough. So for the, let's say, end user tools, we talked about navigation being a huge issue. I can imagine that is for programming as well. I, I think if I read code in an unfamiliar code base, I would scroll up and down to see what are the classes, what are the methods. How does the screen reader for blind people navigate source code? Because does it have headers? Does it take the context into account where you could skip from the one class to the other? Um, yes and no. So uh, it does, but uh, in the same way, that, uh, you know how when you're using a, a development tool, oftentimes you might have little like navigators off to the side and it'll have the list of the classes and methods you can click on them. Oh yeah. Oftentimes those are accessible, so you can still jump around. However, that doesn't mean it's easy. So when you're, one of, I think one of the harder things uh, for blind individuals is that you can navigate a little bit and there's uh, a number of research teams that are working on making those navigators better. but. The, one of the trickier parts is if you've got like a long method, getting context can be difficult. So, you know, 20 lines of really complicated code, you have to kind of memorize it to figure out what's going on, depending upon what you're doing. Oh, so you're saying if you want to comprehend the methods, maybe you read one line, you read another line, but you need to remember all of those. Whereas if you're a sighted developer, you could skip down to maybe the loop that's in the method and like, oh, it loops over all the customers or whatever it does. Yeah, exactly. So like if I'm looking at a screen of code, I can kind of glance up and down to get very quick context. That's a little bit harder if you're blind, right? I guess many of my blind friends would probably say that it's not necessarily harder, but maybe slower. Yeah, or, or different. Different, yeah. yeah. Are there things we can do as developers in that respect? What can we do to make developer tools more accessible? For example, that navigation, can we make our source code more easily navigatable? For source code, it's tough. I think the, the bigger issues are, uh, number one, many of the development IDEs aren't very accessible, or if they are accessible, they sort of break every other release. And it's, again, it's, it's not like it's malicious or anything, it's just people don't think about it. So, um, for example, Visual Studio is sort of accessible right now, but historically, it's sort of, you know, is sort of accessible, sort of not, depending on the release. Or even if it is accessible for certain IDEs, sometimes they make rather adorable decisions. So, for example, 
I remember, boy, I forget which version of Visual Studio it was, but I recall there was a little debugger label and it had a, an arrow on it. And so if you're a blind person or like, let's say a child, instead of giving you information about what you're doing, the debugger would say like graphic 53. And it's like, I get it. You can learn that, but it's sort of weird. You have to, right? So, so is that what you mean with sort of accessible? Can you explain a little bit in more, more detail? What, what does it mean if something is sort of accessible? Um, Studio is sort of. What is it? In what parts is it accessible? In what parts isn't it? I'm trying to think how to describe this. Like, have you ever been on a website and like you could use it, but it sort of bothered you? Yeah, it doesn't feel logical right like the links are all in weird places and it looks strange and stuff like that that's true for accessible interfaces as well so um example if your uh, page wasn't structured with proper formatting then you wouldn't be able to navigate it so you might be able to like go up and down with a b bunch of giant paragraphs but you would definitely be annoyed and with ides it's kind of a similar situation it's sort of like you might be able to navigate the source code editor, but maybe the navigation doesn't work. Maybe certain features are broken. Maybe you'll get to certain windows and you can't navigate through them, or the preferences window won't be accessible, but the other windows are. Maybe the file save dialog is broken. So that, this is the thing is that a lot of these uh, IDEs, it's not so much that they're good or bad as a whole. Oftentimes they're just weirdly inconsistent. So certain interfaces will be broken for a release or two, and it makes it kind of hard, especially if you're a learner. But for professionals too. Yeah, I can imagine. Oh, if inconsistency is bad for any demographic. Yeah, pretty much. And I think it's easy for a dev to accidentally screw it up because they don't do it every like they're I think a lot of IDE designers, they don't usually test with a screen reader. And so they don't really notice when something is broken for the blind. Yeah. G going to that point, what are things we can do if we are in the field of making IDEs or making IDE plugins? One thing we could do is test it with a screen reader. Do you have other concrete tips? Suppose we're in the business of developing IDEs or related tools that are for programmers. What do we do to check? So there's a few things. Number one is uh, if you're at a big company and you have the cash, you can get a consultant to help because it is tricky. And so don't assume that like you have to figure it all out yourself. There's lots of people out there that know how to do it and that can help with it, especially on the web. The web is not perfect nowadays, but it's so much better today than it was, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. And so that's number one. Number two, even though um, definitely turning on a screen reader is a good thing and can help figure stuff out, the, the, the one tricky thing to do is to check it compared to a variety of disabilities. So think that one thing to do is just kind of go through a checklist of what those could be. So for example, um, if you are totally blind, you might use a screen reader, but if you're visually impaired, which is a lot more people, then um, you might think of issues like color contrast and those are online, there's online checkers for that. And it's really easy to do. And even if you're not blind, that's helpful there too. Cause like then color contrast helps people read your page. I mean, people could be colorblind, they could benefit. They could also be colorblind, but they could also just like, it makes it easier to read. Yeah. Like for example, you know, if you have black text on white background, that's really easy to read, but black text on dark gray background, maybe not so much. And so a lot of the issues that you do with accessibility, they tend to have these other little benefits, like your site is generally easier reading, so. So that are the top tips. Get a consultant's help if you can pay for it or use your own app or website or IDE with a screen reader enabled just to see how it feels. Screen reader enabled, but also don't forget that the visually impaired community is larger than the totally blind community. Sure. So think about things like magnification, color contrasts, and stuff like that. Yeah, we haven't really talked about the Braille interface a lot. Oh, yeah, actually, it sounds weird, but actually a lot of the blind community doesn't actually know Braille. That's, yeah, that is surprising. Yeah, it's sort of a bizarre quirk, but think about it like this. If you're blind and you go blind later in life, the question is, do I just turn on a screen reader, which I can download at no cost, or do I buy a Braille display for like three to $10,000? And have to learn Braille. Right. So it's kind of a barrier. However, if you're, at, if you're a young person and you, you know blind from birth or, or very young, Oftentimes, it's a good idea to learn Braille skills because it's a nice way to read, I'm, so far as I understand it. But for us as developers, the Braille interface is not as big of a chunk of the people we can reach as is optimized for screen reader. That's right? true. And if, it's, if your interface is accessible, you most of the time get the Brailling side for free. Now, there is some tricky stuff, like, for example, 
Braille standards change over time, and computer symbols in Braille, like that they use in programming language languages, don't always come out well. So there's readability issues. Like a curly issues. bracket. I'm not exactly sure which ones. I I have a friend that's a Braille expert, and I'm that's not. I, it sounds like you would know about all these things, but a lot of these are really complicated. And Braille is one of those areas I know less about. But yeah, little weird symbols that we often use in programming languages for whatever reason. So, so far we talked about tools, apps, websites, the IDE. One thing that's really important to developers that we haven't covered is the command line. Does a screen reader work on the command line? What does it read? Is that a better interface for people that are visually impaired than running it from an IDE, for example? Um, I say I wouldn't say it's better, but it's definitely uh, most of the time they're accessible. So uh, a command line interface is definitely a nice fallback. But when you think about it, oftentimes when you're programming, a command line inter interface is okay. But IDEs offer you all sorts of stuff like auto refactoring and all that. Th all that. So sometimes it is nice to be able to use an IDE, which is why you know people I think prefer it. However, a command line interface is almost always accessible, which is why it's not a bad option if you have to. Okay, so it's a good idea to have a command interface, command line interface, because it's sort of accessible by default. Yeah, you're probably going to have accessibility support if you use one. Yeah. So you briefly touched upon refactoring support as one of the things that an IDE offers us sighted people. Are those features that blind people can use? Because if I if I think of a refactoring IDE, I think of many things that are visual. I, let's say the rename refactoring. Mm -hmm. I think of selecting a variable. I think of right-clicking, getting a context menu, selecting rename refactoring, getting a pop-up that says, what's the new name? Getting a preview of how my source code will look like in a new version. It's like visual, 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 visual. Yeah, it sounds like it wouldn't be, but they usually are. Yeah, yeah, and they the don't have to be, but they usually are. Yeah, and the reason is because they know most of the time they use normal GUI elements like context menus and stuff, like you're saying. And most of the time, if you've programmed it correctly and like Java isn't broken for accessibility, then yes, they're accessible. Okay. And by the way, I should say, I'm not trying to pick on Java. It just happens to be not accessible. So. If that's the way it is, it's the way it is. I was also thinking about testing, which also is often inherently visual in the sense that a failing test would get oh, right. a red bot. Red yeah, exactly. Yeah. D does, do screen readers read those dots? Uh, I'm not sure about the specific interface for like JUnit or something, but um, generally speaking, those things can be coded to be accessible. And also, you can just dump it to the command line and then it'll be accessible too. Yeah, fair enough. And what about squigglies? If you get oh. a compiler error. Okay, that's tricky. So um, there are a few things in uh, interfaces that are highly visual that aren't super accessible. So um, little squigglies actually are, believe it or not, or at least you can make them. And there's a couple ways you can do it. One is uh, what we do is, in some of our tools for the blind. When you have a squiggly, at the very, very, like, 0.1 seconds, we'll go like... Something oh. like that. So that way, the, the thing is, is that you need it to be right at the beginning of the line because you're going to browse. So you'll be like going up and down between variables like this line, this line. And then you can hear right away that there's an error on the line. So then in that case, you might, you can either query for the error, you can check your compile box, or you can wait to the end of the line and we embed it at the end of a line. So then it would be different from how sighted people would perceive it because for us, the squiggly sometimes is not under the entire line, but in an in the part of the line that is the issue. Oh, so yeah. So granularity would be slightly different because you'd get the error at the beginning of the line. So it's a bit less I think that's right. information. Yeah. But that's OK. Cool. So all these things that we perceive as visual are understandable for blind users or visually impaired. Sometimes. I mean, there are tricky ones. I was just thinking of one. Um, so have you ever used one of those like interfaces for diffs that are highly visual diffs? Oh, yeah. Where you get like red is changed yeah. lines and green is the same lines compared to the previous commit or the master or something. Like yeah. That. It would be awesome if those were accessible, but I'm not totally sure how to do it <laughs> because they're really, really visual and they often use non-standard components. So like custom little drawing tools and things yeah, like yeah. that. So I think it's probably possible. I've just uh, uh, never tried. So. Yeah, you, in theory, you could have something similar where you have the clicks at the beginning of the line for what is red and green for what is the same. Yeah, and blind people definitely can and do use version control. So for example, oh. I know we used to have uh, a number of blind children doing Lego robot competitions. And so they would use, I, if I recall correctly, they'd use Git to send files back and forth to each other because the command lines 
accessible and we make it accessible in some of our little IDEs too. You just, we just could never get like visual diffing working. Yeah. So. Diffing is a hard problem in general, even for people that can see. It kind of is. And even if you get it on the command line, all those weird little Git symbols. Yeah. Those are unreadable by anybody. Yeah. They're unreadable for me also. <laughs> me too. I want to talk a little bit more about the process of development. So suppose you're a blind or visually impaired developer inside a company and you want to communicate architecture. How would you use a UML diagram? Generally speaking, UML is not accessible at all. Um, and when I say that, what I mean is that oftentimes UML is rendered in some way. So you could do it if you either had a graphical render or some other approach. However, oftentimes all UML really does is provide you a sense of the structure. And there's lots of ways to navigate structure. So in other words, if you're at a design meeting and you put UML up on the board, yeah, that's not going to help. But if you have like a development tool where you can navigate the classes and read the code, then that's a way that you can be inclusive of a person that's blind, even if the rest of the team is using UML at the same time. So as long as it's a textual and structural representation, you can re represent class diagrams, but the visual version would be very tricky. Pretty much. Now, there was a really cool dissertation done on it a few years back. I think the guy's name was Alistair King. And um, it was great work, but I don't think that there's really a lot that's happened to make it accessible besides one person's serious, dedicated effort. Yeah, so that's something if we're developer, developers and we want to be inclusive of people that can see or can't see well, we just shouldn't use diagrams. We should keep to structural information that is in the code base rather than auxiliary documents. Yeah, I mean, and you know how that stuff is anyway. It kind of gets out of date and whether, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm sure there are also a few dissertations that say, well, the email diagrams, they get outdated super quickly. Right, or have you read that uh, wonderful paper by Marion Petrie? Do you know which one I'm talking about? No, I don't think I do. What's the uh, title? Do you know that? I think it's called UML in Practice. Oh, yeah. She basically asked, the question of do people actually use UML and the answer was pretty much not much. Yeah. So I mean, a, yeah. An AC paper, I think. AC it was 13. an AC paper. Yeah, we, yeah. Will, we linked it in the show notes. It's not very related to this topic, but it's a great paper. Yeah. Okay. So, so far we've talked about accessibility in tools, websites, and for programming environments. So I want to talk a little bit about your work because you have developed a programming system that is inclusive of blind and visually impaired children. Tell me more. <laughs> So one of the observations that we made right away was that although you could do some work to make some of the tools or IDEs or development environments accessible, some of the barriers that we saw students still having were with the languages themselves. And at the time, we made this sort of really innocent, had this sort of really innocent question, which was why do languages have that design anyway? And what was the evidence for that decision? So for example, if you have a for loop in a language, it's entirely reasonable that that might be the case. But why did they use the word for? And what was the evidence for that choice? Because it wasn't just one person that that impacted, right? Like languages are used by millions of people all over the world. So we might expect that you could just hypothetically go to the programming language design literature, look it up and figure out why they made certain decisions. And you're also thinking about that case where you say, a for loop is pronounced as for open bracket i, et cetera, et cetera. That's yeah. very non-hearable or audible if you have to read it by a screen reader. Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't so much that we thought for is bad or some other word choices. It's just that we were sitting there watching children. Like, you know, they're 14. They barely know how to use the computer. They're just learning programming for the first time. And they're like, for left paren int i? And they're like, I have no idea what this is trying to tell me. And it just made it obvious to me, like, I wonder what other words you could use. Um, maybe we can look it up. But when we looked up information in the literature, there wasn't any evidence of these things. So we decided, let's get some ourselves. So we started running like surveys and we started running them at, at larger scale. We started running um, statistical experiments, comparing competing design choices for syntax. and. Amazing. I'm sure it's not that surprising, but a lot of the times you can make stuff both orally more understandable and more readable by using common sense terminology and getting rid of certain kinds of tokens that you use the scientific method to derive. So for example, a loop in quorum is repeat 10 times. So the, the parameter in a sense, the 10 is in the middle of keywords, right? which might be slightly unexpected for people that are used to other programming languages. Correct. 
But there's also other options. I think there's repeat while and that works just like a while loop. But the key though, is that you need that word repeat because that's a hint to a novice that that's what that does semantically. So for example, the word repeat implies the concept of iteration. So when you look at the statistics for how novices use those tools, if that word's missing, it's a problem. So one of the changes, if I understand it correctly, that you made to your program language quorum is the syntax has to be such that words signify meaning rather than being weird words like for. Right. And also, um, a lot of the punctuation has to be vetted. And the funny thing with those punctuation results is that sometimes they're, sometimes they're kind of odd. So like, for example, um, uh, th this one surprised me. If you look at if statements and you pull out the statistics for if statements, um, Java or many languages use parentheses on the sides, and it turns out those are likely to get screwed up. However, you you also get need to get rid of the left brace, but not the right one, which is sort of a bizarre decision. So in quorum, you have an if, and then you have an expression, and then the word end. So, and it sounds sort of bizarre, but if you leave that left one in, it turns out that the statistical probability of novices getting that one correct are pretty low. So you pull it out and everything's fine. So instead of if open bracket, something, something, close bracket, you have if, and then the condition, Stuff. and then end. Right. And then the other weird decision, but it turns out to be pretty impactful, is if you test, you, you have this question of, should I use the double equal sign or a single equals or a triple equals or something like that? And it turns out that answer is, so it has a surprisingly large effect size. So for example, if I use um, a programming language like uh, Java or Perl or stuff like that, and I compare, I use a double equal sign, if I use a single equal, even if I use the same symbol for assignment, it increases the probability of getting that token correct by eightfold. So it's way better to have, let me summarize that, an equal sign for assignment and also for comparison. Oddly enough, we've, we even designed test cases where we used them both right next to each other to try to trip novices up. Because we were, we were thinking, if we're going to overload it, that's got to follow you up. Turns out not. And is this just for blind kids or for all the kids? Everybody. It used to be in Quorum that like we were we just started with blind children, but now I think it's something like thirty six thousand kids a year ballpark. So a lot more than we would have expected. So. So that were all considerations for syntax. How to make syntax more inclusive so that if you read it, it is easier to read, but also for other kids, it's more inclusive. Does your programming environment also have? IDE-like features to specifically support blind kids that other IDEs or programming tools don't have? Yeah, so we've changed the various features that we have for the blind over time. So, But some of them include additional navigation features that we build into navigators and stuff like that. We have a self-voicing option. So sort of funny, because um, screen readers sometimes break on certain platforms, which is stinky but reality, one of the things that we allow people to do in our um, IDE is basically turn off the default accessibility support and turn on just a different speech engine, which people don't like as much. However, it works everywhere and it's virtually guaranteed to actually talk. And that speech engine is inside of your programming platform. Pretty much, yeah. And it's not, uh, you know, so this is the thing. Oftentimes with accessibility, if you get to 80% and it actually works, it's enough. So in our case, even though the tools that we had weren't really perfect, at the same time, it was enough to bring the number of uh, uh, schools for the blind in the United States that were teaching programming from basically zero to about half. Wow, that, that is impressive. So were there some features that you considered to put into Quorum but didn't make the cut and for what reasons? Oh, in terms of like language features? or IDE features or oh, these okay. things that maybe if we're programming, we think, oh, this is a good idea and you tried it and it didn't work. We want to hear about those. Okay, sure. So um, if you, we do a lot of experiments because normally in Quorum, we, we call it evidence-based and all that really means is that before we change the syntax and semantics of the language and force every developer using it or every kid using it to relearn it, we like, we run a test. And the test is usually, put people in a room, have two people try it, or 50 people try it, or 100 people try it, and see what happens. If it turns out people do pretty well, then it can go in the language. And if it turns out people don't do very well, then we kind of let it fall by the wayside. So we've tried a bunch of these. The one that's the most common that has made it, that is both in quorum and has the strongest evidentiary support for it, is static typing. 
Sounds like a silly thing. It's not like Quorum is the only language that has it, but the evidence is extremely clear that static typing makes developers more productive. If you're using a dynamically linked language, what happens is as you go to call a function, oftentimes developers don't know what to pass to the function, so they go hunting for it. And it turns out in experiments, that amount of time where they're off hunting for what to pass to a dynamically typed function matches the time differences in the studies, which means basically observationally we have evidence that dynamic typing makes uh, programmers slower than static typing does. And this is for sighted developers, but I can imagine it, the effect might be even bigger for blind developers because navigation is such a ba big issue. Because for, for us, just scrolling to the function is just that, just scrolling. But if you're a blind kid or a blind professional developer, the navigation is, is so big of a hurdle, it's even worse, I can imagine. I've actually never tested it with professional blind developers, but I would be very surprised if you were wrong. Yeah. I, I think you're right. So this is a nice example of something that is useful for everyone, not just making it inclusive for blind developers, but it's better for everyone, so it gets in the language. Yeah, I think so. I think it goes both ways. Oh, there's there's one other that maybe maybe your listeners will be interested. So um, the C++ standard a few years back added lambdas to the specification, and we were curious whether or not that had a positive or negative impact. So we ran an empirical study in just comparing C++ lambdas to iterators, which is not the only test you would need to make a determination, but it's a starting point. Oh, it was also what apparently the spec writers in the original white paper claimed it was for. for to whatever. replace iterators. Apparently. So um, we ran a test and we compared freshmen in college, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and then professional developers that we recruited from experts in lambdas. And we found that the experts had no benefit at all, and it basically crushed all of the novices. So it's one of these weird features where, you know, developers put something in the language and maybe it has a benefit, but we found no evidence to that. To and this is that. interesting because People say, oh, I like it because it has lambdas. I mean, I would say that. I say, oh, it's so nice, it has lambdas. But you're saying if we measure if it helps, it doesn't help professionals and it hurts kids and novices. Under the conditions of the test that we ran, yes. And I don't think that lambdas versus iterators is sort of the end of the story. However, we did sort of just take it from what the developers said. And so it's a starting point, but it's possible there's other weird situations where it might help like event-driven programming or database or something, but those need to be verified through the scientific method to see if that's actually true. Yeah. And I think you also mentioned before, not in the show, but when we were chatting before, that lambdas are specifically hard to be pronounced by a screen reader because the order is so different from an iterator. Oh, I don't remember saying that, but actually that does make sense. It's very plausible. And there's sort of a weird wacky syntax. It has a wacky syntax. Yeah. And sometimes with that wacky syntax, believe it or not, uh, this is especially hard for blind children, screen readers don't always read literally, so they skip characters. Oh, what do they skip? That they, seems horrible. All sorts of stuff. And when you think about it, that makes sense for like Microsoft Word, because you don't want to read in every period that would drive you insane. Oh, yeah. So basically what some blind programmers do is they turn on these verbosity modes to make sure they hear everything. But if you're blind and you're just starting out, you don't even know these things exist, likely. And if you have to turn on reading every character, then it gets back to annoying again. So it's sort of like this unfortunate sort of weird middle ground with syntax where it's like, you can do it, but it gets in the way. Yeah, because some programming languages have a dot for list access, and that would be annoying if it would be skipped. I think so. Do you also take that into account in the syntax of Quorum? So you, you were like, oh, let's not use dots because screen readers could potentially skip that? Oh. <laughs> or commas? Actually, um, no. Because we control the speech pipeline separately, we're very judicious about what characters the screen reader says because we control it. Yeah, but I think you mentioned before that sometimes they use Quorum with their built-in screen reader and then maybe they, they Yeah, don't. we cheat there too. Okay, you cheat. Yeah. <laughs> and you overwrite it in a way. Basically, yeah. Because Although we don't actually use dots. This is sort of one of the weird quirky things about Quorum syntax that came from data but mildly annoys me. Uh, we found evidence that the dot operator isn't the operator you should use for objects. For whatever reason, surveys on it at scale show the colon operator makes more sense to human beings. Sort of, it, it drove me crazy enough that I ran a replication study at a different university in a different part of the country just to try to prove it wrong, but unfortunately it replicated with tremendous precision. So you're saying we shouldn't use dots for object access? Oddly. 
Which everyone does. Yes. Almost. It's annoying. The but colons aren't very common. No, I've never seen it. In fact, we kind of put it in there as a junk character. We didn't think it would win the study, but you know, I don't get to choose these things. That is, is interesting. Yeah, it's sort of bizarre. I'm not even exactly. I'm, I have a guess, but I'm not entirely sure why we even observe that result. Like, for example, maybe dot just implies like the end of a sentence or something, or maybe colon implies some kind of connected list or something. I'm not really sure, but, you know, we did it. We got the answer. We replicated it. Got the same answer. I mean, what else do you do? So. Interesting. Okay, but the fact that screen readers read a character or, or don't read a character isn't what influences syntax. Everything you put into Quorum is there because you tried it with people and you measured a result. Not for everything. When we first started the project, we were just working with kids. And so think about it like this. The very first version of Quorum, we made a bunch of decisions and not all of them were evidence-based because that didn't exist. There it was, was just no... the beginning. Exactly. And there was no such thing as an evidence-oriented language. That that did not exist. So, but we found, we figured out really quickly that we needed some evidence to make it better. So then what we did is every time we made a change to the language, we started adjusting it over time. But there are a few decisions in Quorum that are left that we haven't run a study on yet that I think will probably get invalidated. <laughs> One of them is we have this sort of wacky multiple inheritance system. It's not like C++'s, it's sort of it's this own thing, but it would not surprise me if someday, if we get a study together, that it could be invalidated. But we try to do that. That's sort of our goal, is to, so, is to run tests to invalidate our own choices to make them better over time. So an interesting question there is, are there conflicts or tension between the use for a programming language for blind professional developers, the use for learning blind novices or sighted novices or learning adult developers. I mean, you say we tested it on people, yeah. but maybe some features are really great for professional developers that shouldn't be in the language for novices. I mean, it's a little bit like that example you gave with lambdas. For experts, they don't matter, but for kids, they really matter. So are you arguing for one language that's perfect for everyone, or should you tailor a language that's specifically for blind novices and another language that has lambdas and all the bells and whistles for professionals? What is best there? I think that that's a great question. And I think that even the academic community doesn't really know. And there's a really good reason. Uh, it, it turns out that between like the 50s until about 2012, if you take a reasonable chunk of the academic literature in computer science on programming languages, they didn't actually test with people. So we don't have a good sense. Now when I say they didn't test, I mean, almost overwhelmingly universally did not test. Uh, specifically, there's a, um, a scholar by the name of Antti Johani Kayanaho, and he discovered that during that period, only about 22 controlled experiments were conducted. And the thing is, that's just not enough for us to really know. Now, to, be more, to have a more direct answer, we do have evidence, like you say, though, that there are some features that might be in conflict between novices and professionals. One of them is, again, static typing. It turns out most of the studies and replications that we've done are somewhere in the ballpark of like year three of an academic program up through like beginning professional. So we don't really have much good information past that, and we don't have much good information about like children or children with disabilities or children with you know men, women, all these different kinds of groups groups. And I think if we really want to flesh out whether or not we can make languages that find a good middle ground for everybody, we're going to need a heck of a lot more data. From a, but not just for me, from like an entire academic community. Otherwise, we probably won't get there. Yeah. So in general, would you say that not just programming languages, let's zoom out a bit again. So tools, apps, websites, and programming environments, should they have a specific version for the visually impaired and a special version for sighted people. Oh. Like you have an English version and a Spanish version. And you could imagine the same with novice programmers. Should there be a novice programming experience and something developers use, or should it all be the same? What is your take on that? Specialized or generalized? Uh, my vote is for generalized. And you know, I don't have a crystal ball, so I, I can't know for sure, but here's my reasoning. When it comes to the first question, which is specialized for the blind or not, that one I, I would give a hard no. 
And the reason is because sometimes when there's tools that are developed just for the blind, they don't get maintained as well because, you know, a company might make more money off the one that's general purpose than not. So that's one reason why, at least, in the, I don't know how it is uh, where you're from, but uh, in the United States, well, that's one reason why they make laws about making general technology accessible because they don't want, like, Amazon to make, like, the the blind reader that they maintained once and then don't support yeah. for 50 years. Yeah, but okay. Yeah, okay, I hear you, but that is a practical argument or maybe a capitalist argument. Right. It's not a <laughs> philosophical argument oh. about what is best. <laughs> I mean, Fair we enough. can talk about not the world as it is now, but the world as we would like it to be. Do you think a specific app for or, or website for the visually impaired that maybe misses some features that some of the developers would like, is that better or not? suppose we have the money to maintain whatever we want. Okay, that's a fair point. Uh, I, I still think I prefer the generalist, though. Um, and, and the reason is because a lot of the type of stuff that an, let's take an IDE, that an IDE does, are things like buttons and lists and trees and stuff. And those are actually pretty accessible if, if it's there. So I do think that you can make specialized features in IDEs that would be accessible, that would be better, though. So for example, I do suspect you'd want a specialized debugger because right now most debugging technologies don't talk and there are known tech i've invented some talking debuggers over the years oh cool uh, yeah they're they're pretty fun they'll like tell you like what variables are doing and stuff like that they're they're pretty neat the current version that we have the talking debugger is not great but i'm hoping to build some new ones in the uh, some new projects so, we have going. so I, i'm still curious about that talking debugger how does it work and why isn't it great yet? What, what are you going to add there? Uh, so it's a little bit harder to build it on top of like the JVM, JavaScript, and other languages, which is what Quorum compiles to a bunch of different places. So it, during my dissertation work in like the mid 2000s or so, which makes me feel old now, okay. <laughs> um, we we had like a, an interpreted version of uh, C that we were playing around with. And if you can track information about the state of a program in a little bit better way, you can make de debuggers say all sorts of cool stuff, like say what kind of methods are being called as you navigate. Instead of like what line you're on, say, oh, hey, the variable A was set to five. And so you can give people context about what's changing in a program. Of course, the challenges are like what context you give. Yeah. <laughs> so it depends on the task, maybe. It probably does. So the stuff that we did was relatively primitive. We would just kind of tell you the most obvious thing, like, hey, this method was called, or hey, this variable changed. But nonetheless, even with just those changes, the studies that we ran were pretty obviously clear that it's better than saying, you're on line five, you know, which is kind of obvious, but nonetheless, like simple little things can sometimes make a big difference for accessibility. But And they're just not in quorum at this point for technical reasons, not because you don't believe they work well, the technical debuggers. Yeah, some they kind of go in and out with every release as we experiment. So sometimes uh, we are building a new version, so we'll pull something out for a while. And our debugger right now is OK, but it's nothing super special. So I can imagine these type of features, like a debugger that talks, aren't just useful for visually impaired people, but also for sighted people. Can you give a few examples of accessibility features in general, not just in IDEs, but also in apps or websites that are designed for visually impaired people, but also can be useful for sighted people? I think I might have already mentioned this one, but um, probably the most obvious and easy to understand one is uh, color contrast modes. Oh yeah, you mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, a lot of the times, the features that people use with accessibility can actually also be used by people without disabilities. And one obvious one that that blind people use heavily, and so do sighted people, is keyboard shortcuts. And think about it. Some of, my, some of the people that I've known over the years that are blind don't have a monitor or a mouse. And they oh, yeah. Why would they need one? Why would they need it? <laughs> exactly. And so, like, you generally navigate like crazy with the keyboard. So if you're writing an app and you make tons of awesome keyboard shortcuts and ways to navigate around with a keyboard, and you're an expert user, you'll probably like that anyway. But blind people will love you forever. Ah, yeah. So some features you may, you might make them, you might even make them for expert users. You're like, oh, yeah, all the shortcuts. And then they're useful for blind people, but also the other way around. Yeah, exactly. Or just make them for you, because like you might love those things and have them extra, and then blind Most people get them too. Most developers are crazy about keyboard shortcuts. Yeah, that's the thing, right? <laughs> Including myself. So. I'm also curious in the other way around. Are there accessibility features that you can put into a tool or website or app that might hamper sighted people? That we sighted people would be like, why is that there? That is confusing me. It's not helpful. Is that a thing or is that not a thing? Um, yeah, probably. I mean, the uh, 
you know, the, it's really easy as a developer to make a boo boo and make something hard to understand. So a lot of the same things, like, you know, if your content is written in a funny way or your interface um, has weird color contrasts in it or the buttons are uh, aligned in strange ways, or um, a good one might be tab order. Like for a sighted person that's using the keyboard shortcuts, if they have weird tab orders so that you're flying around the interface in a funny way, for a sighted person, that's gonna be odd. You know, oh, like yeah. imagine like a form where it jumps to the wrong spots as you press tab, right? Yeah. For you and I, that because I'm, I'm a sighted person too, that would be really annoying. For a blind person, it would drive them bonkers. Yeah, so. so it can be exacerbated by not being able to see. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Those are all things we can take into account when making stuff for blind people, but also making it accessible for other people. That was everything I wanted to ask. Is there anything you want to add? Anything we missed? Uh, no, I think that you asked a lot of questions that I, uh, I appreciate a whole lot. It made me actually think about it. Cool. <laughs> that's our goal, so. to make our guests think, to make our audience think. We just want to ask you one more thing, if that's okay. If we want to read more about you, your programming language, the cool stuff you're doing, what is your website? Where do we read more about you? Uh, well, I, uh, they can Google Andrea Stefik and my uh, university website is up and I'll send you a link. But if you want to read more about Quorum, you can go to quorumlanguage.com. If you want to read more about evidence, there's a nice little link right on the front and it'll give you um, a bunch of little details about how this evidence thing kind of works. Cool. We'll make sure all of those are in the show, no show notes. Cool. Thank you Thanks very much. for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.